We are finishing our series today called Presidents, Prophets, and Kings. I'm super excited because in four weeks of doing the series, that's the first time I've ever gotten the title right. So <laughs> come on, light me up in the chat, say way to go, Pastor Brad. Uh, this series really is important because uh, we're talking about a story out of the Old Testament. If you have a Bible, go to 1 Kings chapter 18. It's the same story we've been looking at every single week of Elijah and the showdown at Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. And the reason we're looking at this Old Testament story is because it's a lot like what we're facing right now. In, in Israel, they wanted a king because they felt like they saw the other nations had kings and they said, we want a king. And God said, I'm your king. And they said, well, we just want somebody to be our king. And so God allowed them to have a king. But if you look throughout the scriptures, all you see is one king after another just failed them and failed them and failed them and failed them. And, and because they kept putting their hope in a king. It's no different. Last night, we all saw it play out on television President-elect Joe Biden, some people are saying, man, I, I, I'm placing my faith and my confidence in that man, or gosh, I'm not, I'm placing my faith and confidence in the other guy. But what we are learning in this series is that our faith and our confidence have to be in Jesus, and as the church, what we know is this. This is what we've been saying throughout this series, is the answer is not in the White House. The answer is in our house. Wherever you are, turn to somebody and tell them the answer is in our house. The answer is is in our house. The children of Israel, they had rebelled against God. They, the king they had at this time, his name was Ahab. He was a horrific, awful, probably the wor worst king. A and they had just completely gone away from worshiping God. Baal worship was rising uh, in the worship of Yahweh and Jehovah was going away and the temple worship was almost non-existent, but the temple worship and idol worship for Baal was rising quite a bit. And Elijah stands up and he calls the people back. And here's what I believe during this series, and here's what I believe in the middle of what's happening right now, is this message is not for the world. This message and this series is for the church. So if you are part of the church, you are a follower of Jesus, this message is for you. Every week we've been talking about we are, we are all called to be prophets, to stand up and call people back. Not necessarily people in the world. We're to call each other back. Like the church has just drifted and God is calling us back and he's looking for men and women who will be like Elijah and who will stand up and call people back to God. So each week in the series, we've talked about God's calling us back to worship. He's calling us back to sacrifice. He's calling us back to prayer. And today I wanna to talk about this idea of holiness. God is calling us back to be a holy people. So let's go to this story, 1 Kings chapter 18. Been talking about it every week, but if you're just joining us and you're new to the scriptures and you don't know this story, Elijah has had enough and God has told him to stand up against what is happening in the nation. So he calls the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, to the showdown on Mount Carmel. They, they put an altar to their God. They pray to their God. They do all this crazy stuff. Nothing happens. No fire, no nothing, no response. That's what scriptures actually say, no response. And, and then it's Elijah's turn. And Elijah calls the people. He builds this altar, puts the bull on it. Uh, he, he pours water over it, just, just as an exclamation point. And then last week we talked about the prayer that he prayed. And then we come to this passage here. Let's go to verse 38. In verse 38, it says this, after Elijah prayed, immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and it burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and they cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord, he is God. Today, I want to talk to you for just a few moments about holiness in a hopeless world. Holiness in a hopeless world. Let's pray. God, in this moment that we have, uh, this is not church as we want to do it, but it's church as it is right now. And so would you somehow, God, through the power of your spirit, move across the city, uh, maybe across other states. We recognize, God, we know that people are watching all over the world right now in, in different countries, and we're all united under the banner of Jesus. So in this moment, uh, God, a lot of distractions are there, but you have a word for each of us, and would you help us in Jesus' name, amen. Well, a couple of weeks ago, our, our staff was talking about dated slang terms. And the reason we were doing this was because one of our staff members, and some of you know Megan, she's got a teenager, and 
anybody has got a teenager knows this, uh, they will call you out when you are using a dated slang term. And so we were talking about these different terms that we use and, and how dated they are. So I've got a list of slang terms, and, and I want you to see if maybe you use this term, and then I'm going to tell you how dated it is. So here's a really popular one that's really trending right now. It's the word malarkey. That's what President-elect Joe Biden is saying. He's saying it all the time. It's a bunch of malarkey. That's the word he uses. If you, you use that word, by the way, you are so 1920s. Like, that's from 100 years ago. And I know right now, like, how do you use that in a sentence? Just ask any Trump supporter right now. They're saying, President-elect Joe Biden, that's a bunch of malarkey. Okay, so that's, that's how you use that in a sentence. All right, how about, how about the word Cool. Do you ever find yourself saying the word cool? I find myself every once in a while saying the word cool. That phrase came in in the 1930s. That's how old that one is. Uh, do you use the word hip? Man, that is so hip. Well, that is so 1950s. How about the word awesome? This is one I'm, I use this one a lot. I kind of think, and I was asking other people, I'm not sure this is a slang term anymore. I feel like it's just a regular word in the English language now. But that came in. The 1970s, that's when people started saying the word awesome. How about this one? Whatever, whatever. Yeah, that, 1980s, anybody remember that one? 1980s is when that one was. How about this one? That is so epic. Oh my goodness, that movie was epic. Again, so 1980s. All right, here, here's one. Does, do, you, do you say this anymore where you say a phrase and at the end of that phrase you say, not <laughs> Yeah, like this is what Joe Biden's supporters would be saying right now. Hey, you know Donald Trump could still be elected? Not. <laughs> okay, how about this? this? How about this one right here? Talk to the hand. Remember that one? 1990s. And, and one more. Let me give. Let me give you one more. Anybody still saying legit? Man, that is so legit. Well, if you're saying legit, you are so. 1890s, 1890s, that's when that phrase came into being. I, when I think of that, they, they took the word legitimate, shorted it to legit. I could just see it now. I just see, what I see in my mind is like a woman in a big puffy dress with a little umbrella going, oh, Henry, that hat is so legit. I just, but hey, whatever. So today, I want to talk about a word that I think in the church is kind of feels out it, it, it feels kind of like nobody says it anymore, and it's kind of gone out of style. And that's the word holiness. But what we see from the scriptures is holiness is, is a word that's really been around before the dawn of time. And I think what we got to do is we got to bring this word back. If you go back to the book of Leviticus, one of the first books in the Bible, God told Moses to tell the people this in Leviticus 19.2, you must be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Now, I, I think most people have given up on holiness because it just seems so unattainable. Like that's for missionaries and monks and the Billy Grahams and the Mother Teresas or, or it's for the people in the Bible. I mean, that's why they call it the Holy Bible. I mean, it's just no one can do this. But holiness isn't for a select few. It's for you. Come on, turn to somebody wherever you are and tell them holiness is for you. Like holiness, it's for you. Now, when you hear that, I know what you say. You, not me. Not me, because I'm not perfect. But if you think that's what holiness is, today I want to introduce you to what holiness really is, because it is not about being perfect. So what is holiness? And, and is it even attainable? Let's look at this story from Elijah, because I really think we get some answers and some understanding about holiness from this story. Go back to uh, 1 Kings 18, 38, and the scriptures say this, immediately, what, say it with me, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven, and it burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up the water in the trench. Now, here's what we all know about fire. Fire can be destructive, but fire can also be purifying. Like, we've seen the destructive wildfires in California and Colorado, but this fire, it, this fire is not a destructive fire. God could have destroyed the nation of Israel for what they were doing. Now, we've been talking these past few weeks about Baal worship, 
But you know about the, the idols and the temples, but what we haven't talked about is the practices and the things they were doing. What they were doing was so deplorable and disturbing. One of the things they had was forced prostitution, sex slavery. Women all over the nation had to come to the temple and they had to offer themselves sexually to a prophet to appease the God of Baal. The prophets would go out and the women would be lined up and they would, of course, pick out the most attractive of the women, which meant that some of the women were waiting three to five years living around the temple, away from their families, hoping that they would be chosen, that they could appease the gods. And that is, that is disturbing. That is deplorable. That, that is so degrading and demeaning to women. But that wasn't all. Whenever the, their nation faced a severe crisis or a plague or something like that, they would offer their children as a sacrifice. This is what was happening there. But somehow, some way, God said, I'm not gonna destroy you, I'm gonna show you mercy. Now, I know when I say that, some of you have read down a few verses and you go, yeah, but what about the prophets of Baal? He didn't show mercy to them. But what you have to understand here is the prophets of Baal, they were the leaders. They were the ones responsible. Not only were they the ones who were responsible, but listen, they were, not going to, they were not going to relent. They were not going to stop, and they certainly weren't going to bow. When you look at the end of the story, the nation of Israel, all of them bowed in submission to God, but the prophets of Baal, they did not. And here's what God does. If you're not a follower of Jesus, this is what I want you to know. God stands up for the vulnerable. God stands up for those who can't stand up for themselves. God stands in the gap because he's a God of mercy and he's a God of justice. He, and so he made a way for the people as a God of mercy. He made a way for the people to be forgiven. That's what the altar in the story is about. That's what Elijah's sacrifice is about. This wasn't a destructive fire. It was a purifying fire. Why? Because if you read in the Old Testament, you see that the nation of Israel, God had said, you are a holy nation. I've set you apart, away from and apart from other nations. And by the way, that's what holiness means. If you've ever wondered what does holiness mean, it doesn't mean being perfect. Holiness simply means to be set apart, to be set apart. In other words, God calls us to live different than the world. This world is full of abuse. This world is full of anger. We're seeing it played out right now all over social media. This is a divisive time in our nation. We see resentment. Uh, we, we see uh, violence. We see murder. We see all kinds of atrocities and evil. And what God is saying is, I have set you apart, and I want you to show the world a better way to live. You've been set apart. You're to be a holy people. Fast forward to the New Testament, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, he was the uh, one who was pointing out Jesus. And he said this about Jesus in Matthew 3.11, he, being Jesus, he will baptize you with what? Say it with me, the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, if you're new to church or new to the scriptures, let me kind of explain something to you very simply. In the Old Testament, the fire of God was in the temple, and there was the Holy of Holies, and that's where the presence of God was. It was in the temple. But in the New Testament, because of Jesus, because of the cross and the resurrection, and when the Holy Spirit came and, and fell upon the people in Acts chapter two, what we know is that the Holy Spirit went from the temple and to us, into us. Paul says that you and I are temples now. We are temples of the Holy Spirit, and his fire now is in us. So think of it like this. You and I are many temples. We are many temples sent out to light up the world with the good news of Jesus. Come on, turn to somebody wherever you are and say, you, my friend, are a mini temple. You are a mini temple. Like we are torchbearers. Wherever we go, we take the holiness of God. We are missionaries on mission assigned to a mission field. We prayed for our neighbors earlier. Guess what? You are a mini temple in your neighborhood. You're a mini temple in your workplace. You are a mini temple on, on, on your campus, and you are there 
to light up the world with the grace of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness, the hope, and the healing, and the peace, and the purpose of our Savior. And here's the thing, set apart, by the way, doesn't mean set above. We've got to be careful here. doesn't mean, you know, holier than thou or, or better than. This was the attitude of the Pharisees, the religious leaders in Jesus' time, and he called them out on this all the time. They, they always felt that they were holier than everyone else around them. In fact, they wouldn't even associate or allow people who were quote-unquote unclean or had a sickness or a disease. They could not even touch them or be in the presence of them because they were holy men. They would not associate with quote-unquote sinners because they were holy men. Of course, we know Jesus just wrecked that by touching those who were sick, touching those who were lame, by eating with sinners. But the, but the Pharisees, no, they, they, in fact, the way they dressed, the way in which they dressed was crazy. They, they had robes and tassels and they had jewels. Why? Because they wanted to, first, God gave them that as a way to show who they were as a person, but it began to become prideful and they became pious and they got all these jewels because they wanted to show everybody, this is how holy I am. Honestly, this reminds me of the church that I grew up in. I don't know if you grew up in church. Maybe you didn't grow up in church. I, I grew up in, in, in church, and I grew up in the era of do's and don'ts. You, you don't do this. If you want to be holy, you don't do this. If you, if you want to be holy, you, you do this, and you don't go here, and you don't do that. I, growing up, and this, if you didn't grow up in church, this may sound crazy, but growing up, I couldn't go to movies. I couldn't go to movies because it was considered unholy. Now, I was like, what makes it unholy? I, I don't know. We just, why can't we go to the movies? I, I don't know. We just don't go. We just don't go to those places. So I was a child of, of the late 70s, and that was when Star Wars came out. Everybody was watching Star Wars except for this kid. I wasn't allowed to watch it. You know what's crazy, though? We would go to Burger King and get the collector cups. I had an R2-D2 cup, a C-3PO cup, a Chewbacca cup, Darth Vader. I knew every character from Star Wars, but I wasn't allowed to watch, go to the movie house to watch it because that's where, I don't know, I guess the sinners hung out. I, I, I don't know. Uh, this is crazy, though. So I've never, ever been a Star Wars fan. I've never gotten into Star Wars for that very reason. My kids are like, Dad, you got to watch Star Wars. So during the pandemic, remember the first part when we were all shut down? I said, all right, I'm going to sit down. I'm watching the first Star Wars. Can I be honest with you? In the first 45 minutes, I felt so guilty. I was like, oh, I know I'm sinning. Oh, I know this isn't right. Oh, this is so wrong, but it's so good. It's so wrong, but it's so good. <laughs> so what was it like for you growing up? Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe you didn't grow up in church. What was your view of church? I want to give you a moment to share with somebody around you. What was it like for you? Take a moment, share with somebody around you. I'd like for you to write this down. Holiness is not something I do, it's who I am. Holiness is not something I do, it's who I am. The Apostle Paul helps us with this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse two. He talks about it, he says, he, that's God, God made you holy by means of what? Of Christ Jesus. There's nothing we can do to make ourselves holy. There's nothing you can do. It, it's only through the cross and the work of Jesus that you have been made holy. It's not about reading your Bible more, praying more. Hey, you know, if I just, you know, I, I can't miss church online. I, man, if I, if I, I, I'm so glad I'm here today because, whew, that's helping me to, now I'm holy because I got to go to church. You know, I cussed a little less this week, uh, so that somehow makes me holy. Now listen, reading your Bible, praying, joining us online, you know, watching your, your, your language, those are all good things, but they are not going to make you holy. Out, here's the thing, outward expressions do not lead to inward transformation. The Pharisees tried this. They tried all the outward expressions. They tried to do all the right things. And you know what Jesus called them? Whitewashed tombs. They were dead on the inside. This is why so many people in the world say the church is full of nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. 
This is why sometimes when you see people, you're like, man, they do all these things, but the way they are on the inside doesn't match up. I hear what they're saying. I see what they're doing, but, but I can tell something's not right on the inside. It's because you can't make yourself holy. So stop trying. Stop trying to earn it and instead receive it. So the fire falls from heaven, it consumes everything, the bull, the wood, the stone, and the water, and it says this in verse 39, when all the people saw it, when, when all the people saw the fire, they fell face down on the ground and they cried out, the Lord, he is God, yes, the Lord, he is God. Now, what's interesting here is when we see this, we think, wow, what an amazing moment, and it truly was because they had, in this moment they are acknowledging God's holiness, but what I want you to see here is there is no real true repentance in this prayer. In other words, they were convinced, but they were not consumed. They, they, they eventually went back to their old ways and their old practices. They left the fire at the altar. If you're taking notes, write this down. Don't leave the fire at the altar. Don't leave the fire at the altar. In other words, don't come into an experience like this. Don't join us on, online and, 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 and experience the, the fire of God, the presence and the power of God, but then go back to your old ways or, and, and leave the fire here. Because God doesn't want to be a part of you, man. He wants to consume you. That's what Hebrews 12, 29 says this. Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is what? He's a consuming fire. He doesn't want part of you, and he wants all of you. Does he consume you? See, when his fire consumes you, you're like a mini temple, and it goes with you everywhere that you go, your workplace, your neighborhood, your campus, uh, everywhere that you are, there is the fire of God. It, it uh, determines your decisions. It, it, it affects your attitude. It, it, it shapes who you are. It, 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 it works in all of your interactions, how I interact with others. When I have the fire of God and it consumes me, it goes everywhere with me. Laura uh, got a text yesterday from someone, and uh, I just wanted to share it with you. As we all heard the news yesterday, everybody, some of you excited, some of you frustrated that uh, Joe Biden is president-elect Joe Biden. And throughout this series, I've just been trying to say the answer is not in the White House, it's in our house I love it that we have a democracy and we have elected officials, but the answer isn't in the White House. It's in our house. And she got this text and it said this, I just want to say that I, I really appreciate the staff, especially Brad, staying neutral through the election season. That's been intentional, by the way. It's been very disheartening the way some have been on social media, and I just want you to know that you're appreciated. Regardless of who's in the White House, God is in our house. And I hope the church wakes up to the fact that we should be the light guiding the lost to Jesus, not guiding people to a certain candidate. As followers of Jesus, we are called to be a holy people. We're called to be set apart to show the world a better way to live. Let's be torchbearers of his holiness. Holiness. 